Welcome to this narrated lecture entitled Fascism, 1919 to 1945, Italy and Germany. Over the course of this lecture, we will learn how fascism is defined, why it became so popular after World War I, who the major players were, and what impact fascism has had on 20th century history. Any discussion of Italy in the post-war period must begin with the mutilated victory. In 1918, Italy was victorious in World War I, having fought alongside the Allies against the Germans and the Austrians. Despite this victory, many Italians believed that their role was underappreciated by the other Allied powers. Italy was promised very little at the Treaty of Versailles negotiations, negotiations in Paris in 1919, and this left a real sense of bitterness, a real feeling that uh, Italian losses at the front were were really uh, being ignored by the British and the French especially, and this left a real sense of bitterness amongst many Italians. On top of this feeling of bitterness, this sense that their victory was mutilated, there was an economic depression that had swept Italy after the war. Workers were restless, they were very unhappy with low pay and, and poor working conditions. People of the middle classes, professionals, lawyers, doctors, skilled workers, and also landowners, feared a communist revolution. They had seen what had happened in Russia in 1917, and they had seen what Lenin and Trotsky and Stalin were doing to essentially re-engineer Russian society, and this really scared them a great deal. On top of the economic turmoil, political parties in the Italian parliament were unable to form a majority. And this left many Italians with the sense that Italian democracy was faltering, that it was in a period of crisis, and that it would not be strong enough to deal with the very serious political and social crises that were affecting Italy. And this didn't even include the economic meltdown that Italy was suffering. There was also a lot of violence in uh, the cities because many workers had gone on strike in 1919 and 1920, threatening to shut Italy down. On top of this, peasants began to seize land in some areas of the country. So if you were a middle class person and you were viewing what's going on in Italy, you have a real sense of fear that a socialist, a socialist revolution was imminent. And this led to a lot of street violence between young socialists and young fascists. So Italy is really dealing with very serious crises by 1920. Political, economic, social, and also diplomatic. Uh, Italians really fear um, that their position as a world power is being is being threatened. And we can see here in this picture uh, representatives of the Allies, the Paris Conference, Vittorio Orlando, who was second from the left, was the Prime Minister of Italy at the time, and he was responsible for making sure Italy got what it deserved at the bargaining table. And unfortunately, he came back to Italy without much to show for his efforts. So as a leading Italian politician, he uh, was unable to really calm the fears of, of many Italians that Italy had gotten its due at the negotiations. Let's now discuss the rise of Italian fascism. After World War I, Squadristi became very, very prominent fixtures in the Italian political scene. Squadristi were groups of demobilized Italian soldiers who would come to form the nucleus of the Italian fascist party. The Squadristi were patriotic Italians. They were nationalists. This means that any kind of social group or political group that they felt were threatening Italian stability 
or threatened Italian values or didn't show enough devotion to uh, Italy were dangerous and they picked on the socialists as the greatest threat to to its uh, stability in Italy tactics they they used to intimidate the socialists included going to socialist party headquarters and destroying printing presses beating up socialists at union meetings uh, killing them uh, in some cases they would hold Italian socialist men down and shave off half their mustache uh, as uh, a humiliating gesture and we'll also see this later with the brown shirts in Germany the uh, the violent wing of the the Nazi party who would beat up socialists and Jews and other people they believed were not German or were not German enough were not patriotic enough so it, within fascism you have this bare knuckle violent kind of aura that uh, is going to make it very very dangerous by 1922 300,000 men were members of the fascist movement so we can see how devastating the crises were in Italy that would allow so many uh, men to be attracted to this movement the man on the right Italo Balbo who would eventually become the head of the Italian Air Force under Mussolini uh, he's a good example of an early squadristi leader he was also a good friend of Mussolini in the early days in 1922 he actually led a fascist march on the town of Ferrara where he forced the mayor there to give all of the men in line all 50,000 jobs and this was this was the kind of uh, tactics of intimidation that the squadristi used on a regular basis and it would come to really define fascism in Italy this kind of street level thuggish violence that um, was meant to really prevent any kind of socialist movement within the country in October 1922 Benito Mussolini was asked by King Victor Emmanuel to form a government and this is a very very important turning point in modern Italian history because here King Victor Emmanuel is really turning away from a democratic solution to the problems affecting Italy and he's choosing the one man who is the strong arm candidate the man who's promising to fix Italy by any means necessary Mussolini was a socialist before World War One uh, and during the war he uh, left the party because of his support of the war you may remember from your reading that uh, socialists all across Europe had actually stood against World War I um, in, in many cases uh, the, the rank and file socialists the, uh, the average socialist worker went to war as his national duty but many socialist leaders in Italy, in France, in Britain, and elsewhere had felt that the war would be disastrous for the working class and uh, had opposed it. And this put Mussolini in a very, very uncomfortable position. So during the war he swung from left to right and became leader of the fascist party and became an ardent nationalist and anti-socialist and this is a very very common um, thing uh, many socialists became uh, became fascists later on in their, their their lives Mussolini had bragged of his supposed war record he was wounded at the front however it wasn't in battle as he had told everyone he was actually standing in a trench during maneuvers and a shell fell 
uh, close to the trench he was standing in, and a piece of shrapnel landed in his leg, and uh, he he led everyone to believe that he was uh, a wounded war veteran, but uh, that wasn't the case. What gave Mussolini the opportunity to be named Prime Minister in 1922 by the King was the fact that he had the support of prominent members of Italy's elite, industrialists, landowners, and army officers. Those who had the most influence in Italian political, economic, and social life believed that Mussolini would be the one to save Italy from communism. Again, this fear of communist revolution was everywhere, and the middle classes, especially not just the Italian elites, were so afraid of Italian of Italy becoming a Soviet ty- a type country that they were more than happy to to give Mussolini a try and put power in the hands of the squadristi. Once in power, Mussolini arrested liberal and socialist critics. He used the squadristi, who were now called black shirts because of the color of their uniforms, to quiet these critics through intimidation or arrest. By the end of 1926, all non-fascist parties were outlawed in Italy. The government took control of the press. Newspapers, any kind of film, any kind of uh, information was censored by the government. And it really leads us to a very unusual time in Italian and world history because Mussolini, who had been invited to become prime minister through the democratic process, was now in the process of undermining it. But to the rest of the world, he was really given broad praise. A lot of people don't realize this, but Mussolini and then Hitler after him were given a lot of credit for creating order in Italy and in Germany. Mussolini bragged that he had made the trains run on time in Italy, something that had never been done before or since. And uh, this is really something very interesting to think about, the idea that... um, a dictator, a dictator was needed to solve the problems facing Italy that democracy could not even begin to handle. And the power of Mussolini's statement can be seen in the fact that if you go to Italy today, you know, the trains very rarely run on time. They're either an hour early, an hour uh, late, or they just don't show up at all. So his statement was very, very powerful. You know, I made the trains run on time for people outside of Italy, he was a hero in a sense because he had prevented a communist revolution in Italy. That was the greatest fear, not only for Italians, but also for the French and the British and even the Americans who were seeing what was going on in Russia, how the Soviets were reorganizing uh, Soviet society, and Mussolini was given broad praise for really defending capitalism and defending Uh, Italy from uh, any kind of communist takeover. On the right, we can see bottles of wine with Mussolini's image. This photograph was taken about eight or ten years ago, and it goes to show how the image of Mussolini, the legacy of Mussolini, um, is still prevalent in Italy. You you see his image uh, in many different places. Even though he came to a very ruinous end, in uh, 1943, when he was captured by partisans and executed, um, it's still very curious to see uh, his image all over Italian popular culture. You don't see this in Germany with Hitler at all. Let's take a look at what fascist ideology is. The word fascism comes from the Roman symbol of authority, as you can see on you're right. This axe was used by the Roman emperors as a symbol of their authority. And basically, if you look at the handle, you can see individual rods bound together as one. And it's a a symbol of strength, and it's a symbol of authority, 
and ultimately for the fascists, the symbol of the nation. Fascists sought a third way between communism and liberal democracy. Fascists believed that their ideology was the new cutting-edge way to organize society. They didn't like liberal democracy, as we're going to come to see. They don't, well, they hate communism, as we have seen. So they really see themselves as a third way, as a brand new way of organizing society and its politics. And now let's get a more in-depth view of fascist ideology. Basically, fascism was a movement that sought social and political unity, order, and discipline through national solidarity. Now, this might seem like a convoluted definition, but what I'm going to try to do over the next couple of minutes is tease out some of these ideas. National solidarity is the key phrase here. Fascists celebrate nationalism, celebration of patriotism, love of nation, identification with a national group. This is really what fascism is based on. Communism uh, is different. It was, it's based on class struggle and class identity. And what fascists seek to do is they seek to transcend or go beyond class differences and bring unity back to the nation through love of country and through sacrifice to nation. Because of the complexity of fascism, it is probably easier to understand fascism through what it's not. Uh, basically, <laughs> uh, fascism is extremely emotional, anti-rational, and anti-enlightenment. It's anti-liberal, anti-individual, and anti-class conflict. Let's start with extremely emotional. You may have seen p old pictures of Adolf Hitler giving a speech, and the one thing that strikes us is the fact that he's very animated at the podium. He's banging his fist. He's almost screaming at the audience. Uh, he's trying to get their attention. And the way he's doing it is through uh, calls to, to patriotism and sacrifice for the nation. He's appealing to the heart. Fascists believe that the way you get people to follow is by appealing to the heart, not the head. You appeal to their emotions, not their reason. Secondly, fascism is anti-rational and anti-enlightenment. You may remember from your World Civ II or Western Civ II courses, uh, a unit on the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was a uh, political, philosophic, and social movement of the 18th century where the philosophes celebrated reason, using your senses to find truth, your eyes, your ears, your, um, you know, taste, touch, you're using um, not faith or emotion to find truth. Uh, and for the fascists, they believe that any kind of rationality is, is really a waste of time. If you're going to change Germany, if you're going to make it great, if you're going to take it out of the doldrums of World War I, then the way you do it is through emotion. You get people to act based on their heart, not their head. You don't think about problems. You go ahead and you solve them. They really believe that any kind of rationality is uh, really tied up with, say, college professors, you know, who sit around and think about ideas and think about problems but do nothing to solve them. Anti-liberal. Fascists hate liberalism, the idea of a society based, based on the individual. And this goes with anti-individualism as well, the next point I have here. Uh, for fascists, if you're going to have a society based on social and political unity, order, and discipline, you cannot have a system where everyone has a different opinion, or you vote on on pol you vote for politicians who get up there in office and just pander to the public and don't take strong stands on issues and don't do the heroic thing for the nation. 
And lastly, as I mentioned before, anti-class conflict. Fascists believe that you can be a great Italian or a great German without without being rich or without being poor. It doesn't matter. Uh, even a, a, a worker or a rich lawyer can still be servants of the state and servants of the nation. So uh, fascists really reject cl- any kind of class conflict. And this is something that they, they really that makes them differ quite a bit from communists. Communists celebrate ca- class conflict and division. Uh, communists believe that the working class is the class of the future. Fascists reject this totally. The historian Peter Gay once famously wrote that the attraction of fascism had something to do with the people of Germany and Italy having a hunger for wholeness. The idea that fascism fed on people's desire to feel connected to something larger than themselves. The psychological dislocation of World War I was the first reason. Uh, Many people in Europe, especially in um, Italy and Germany, had lost a family member, friends. Um, They had seen the destruction that the war had brought home, the shortages of food, uh, and it really left people with this psychological letdown. You may you, you have to remember that World War One was the worst war known up to that time. It was the bloodiest. Between uh, you know nine and eleven million people died, and millions more were wounded. They were maimed. Uh, a lot of suicides uh, as a result of the war. People felt that they had become become almost unhinged from reality. If you look at the great monarchies of Europe, Germany, Austria, Russia had all collapsed because of the war, so people felt the sense that the authority figures that they had known were now gone. The psychological devastation of losing countrymen and loved ones, all of this really fed the sense that uh, there was a desire to feel whole again, and that fascists were really knew this. They understood this and wanted to connect with people on that level. Another theme that's very prevalent in fascism is the cult of the soldier. Fascists want to recapture the excitement of 1914. You may remember that back when the war began in 1914, everybody in Europe was very excited to go to war. Young men signed up in droves. And this kind of excitement, this, this, this desire to lay down your life for your nation is really the essence of, of fascism. The idea that uh, only the heroic can stand up and give their life and put on a uniform and not be afraid to face death for the fatherland. On the left here you can see members of the Fry Corps uh, or Free Corps who were a regular soldiers, uh, a regular a regular unit that um, was often called upon by the German military to do very very uh, crazy and um, uh, dangerous assignments behind the lines. If you needed men who were willing to go out on a limb and go behind enemy lines and really stick their neck out. He called on the Fry Corps. And many, many of these guys, uh, after World War I, became members of the Nazi Party. They really celebrate the cult of the soldier and this idea that only soldiers really understand what it means to uh, look death in the face and walk away to tell the tale. So the Fry Corps was really a celebrated uh, part of the, uh, the German military in the, in, uh, during World War I. Here is a classic photo of Benito Mussolini and Adolf Hitler taken sometime in the 1930s. And one thing you um, you may want to keep in mind is the idea that once these men came to power, they no longer wore civilian uniforms. They were only seen in military uniforms. And this tells us something, that to be a great fascist leader means you're also a great military leader. And what does it mean to serve in the military? It means to not be afraid to lay down your life for the nation. And 
it also means the idea that you give yourself totally to the state. And this is this goes back to the Nazi dislike of, of the individual, um, because individuals think for themselves, individuals make their own decisions, but if you're part of a larger group, the nation, you're called upon to sacrifice your individual rights and your individual desires and needs for the nation. And this is something very important to remember. Now that we have a general idea of the theoretical underpinnings of fascism, let's turn toward German fascism. German fascism was called Nazism. Adolf Hitler became leader of the National Socialist Movement in 1921. Hitler was a soldier in the German army during World War I. He was uh, a corporal. He was uh, awarded the Iron Cross for bravery in battle. And he had a very, um, not so much privileged upbringing, but he was a middle class uh, youth from Austria, and he spent many of his formative years in Vienna, which was really a hotbed of anti-Semitism. And he was an artist who was actually rejected from the art school he had tried to gain admission to, uh, all along becoming a real uh, integral part of the um, anti-Semitic culture of Vienna. When World War I rolled around in 1914, he applied for admission to the German army and was granted the right to join the army. And he he wrote that it was the greatest moment of his life, that he had kissed the ground and thanked God that he would be able to to serve uh, to serve Germany. After the war, he was actually assigned by the German army to uh, essentially spy on this new budding national socialist movement that had sprung up in Germany. It was uh, seen at the time by the armies being very dangerous. It was an ultra-nationalist party. It was anti-Semitic. And Hitler instead uh, left the army and joined the party <laughs> he was supposed to be spying on and became... Um, leader in 1921. He ro rose to the ranks very, very quickly. In 1923, Hitler led the Beer Hall Putsch, which was his attempt on behalf of the National Socialist Movement to over overthrow the Weimar Republic. He believed that the Republic was so weak and so unpopular with the German people that he would be successful and he would take power by force. Little did he know that uh, there was very little support for a coup at that time, and he was thrown in jail. In uh, 1924, when he was released from jail, he decided that the Nazi movement would have to be elected to achieve power. And this is something that is very significant in the history of the Nazi party. No longer would the Nazis seek power through violence. They would seek it through the democratic process. So they would uh, be elected to the Reichstag, the German parliament, through democratic means. They would try to get the German voters to elect them. And then once they get into power, the idea was then you would subvert democracy. So the great irony of, uh, of fascism in Italy, Italy and Germany is, is that they that both parties gained power through the democratic process and then they did all they could to very quickly subvert it. And we could see it left an original copy of Mein Kampf, which in German is translated as My Struggle. It's Hitler's autobiography and it really outlines his views on uh, nationalism, the place of Germany in the world, and also his views on Jews. It's um, still banned in Germany today, and um, it, it really is a, a, a terrible book. It's, it's really poorly written. It's really the, the ravings of, of a lunatic, and um, I use it in my house as a doorstop. I, I, I think that's a, really what it's useful for. But if you're a historian, it's, it's interesting to look at to get a sense of what's going through Hitler's mind as he's plotting to come to power. The Nazis attracted people who were alienated from German society. 
Many were lower middle class people who feared socialism. And this is a, a dynamic that's similar to Italy. The idea that, look, if you don't vote for the fascists, then the other option is either a weak, wimpy democracy or worse, much worse, communist revolution. You know, everybody has their eye on Russia and their eye on the new Soviet Union and what's going on there. And there's a real fear amongst German society that if, if communism sweeps through Germany, then there goes private property and in comes unregulated state power. So the fascists very, very uh, cleverly use this sentiment in both Italy and uh, in Germany. It's what gives the Nazis a lot of credibility. They stand up for private property, they stand up for the nation, and they're anti-communist. They were also given a lot of support by the fact that in 1919 there was an attempted communist coup in Germany led by the Spartacists. The two people who were responsible were Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, who were leaders of the Spartacists, and they essentially wanted to create a communist state in Germany, much as the Soviets had done in Russia. So the Nazis could simply point back and three or four years back at time and say, look, see, uh, this is a very, very real threat. The Nazis very cleverly blamed uh, Weimar for all of Germany's problems. A lot of ministers in the Weimar government were socialists, some were Jews, uh, and they said, look, you know, they are the ones who stabbed us in the back. They're the ones who sold us out at Versailles. They're the ones who made Germany sign the part of the treaty that blamed them for the whole war and, and made them pay for the whole war. That's one of the great things about uh, the Treaty, treaty of Versailles that Hitler was able to draw upon, the idea that um, the Germans were sold out by the Jews and the socialists. Historians now believe that uh, Germany didn't get such a bad deal at uh, Versailles, that it could have been a lot worse for them. But Hitler was still able to People don't know that at the time. You know, we know that in hindsight that uh, they, they, it, could, they could, it could have been a lot worse for the Germans. Uh, also, the economic depression that was part of German life in the 20s was also blamed on Weimar, and the Nazis were able to really uh, capitalize on this, the idea that Weimar just was not strong enough to deal with these problems. Hitler stressed a new order based on fascist ideology. And this was really the Nazi platform, that Germany would be brought back to an age of greatness, that Germany would reclaim its place as the leader of not only uh, Europe, but also the world. And he really was able to um, draw a lot of support in the 1920s. And we can see here uh, on the right, the first Party Day rally in January 1923, which drew quite a few supporters of the Nazi cause. In theory, Italian fascism and Nazism are similar. The major difference is the Nazi emphasis on race. Now, Nazism is a type of fascism. So when we talk about fascism, we're talking about Nazism as well. It's it's um, it's distinct in, in, in some ways. The major distinction is the fact that for the Nazis, race is very, very important, especially anti-Semitism, uh, this hatred of Jews. And this is something that in many ways drives Nazism in a way that we really don't see an Italian fascism. And part of the, the, the reason is, in, in my view, that in Italy the Jewish population is excessively small, and it wasn't something that Italian fascists really picked up on. As a matter of fact, uh, in the early days of Italian fascism, there were actually Italian Jews who were fascists. One of Mussolini's ministers of justice was actually Jewish. One of Mussolini's um, mistresses, he had many in his lifetime, but, but one of his mistresses was, was Jewish as well. And it wasn't until 1936 when uh, Mussolini signed a treaty with Hitler and Germany and Italy became allies formally that 
this issue really came to a head. I mean, a lot of Italians really didn't understand why Mussolini would even have anything to do with this racist. You know, why would why would you really need to pick on the Jews? So this is something that hampered Mussolini at home after 1936. But in Germany, it really played well. And one of the reasons is that uh, Germany had uh, a much bigger Jewish population, and it was really much easier to make an issue out of it. And uh, on top of that, there was also uh, you know, a history of anti-Semitism, not only in Germany, but in Europe. France, Russia, Poland had all experienced outbreaks of uh, anti-Semitism throughout the, you know, through a thousand years of, uh, of history, and this is something that Hitler was able to really, to really draw upon. You know, uh, Hitler didn't invent anti-Semitism. He just used it, uh, to his advantage because anti-Semitism was a very, very important, if negative, part of German and European culture. By 1929, the economic depression radicalized the German electorate. Now things were becoming so bad in Germany that people were looking for the most radical solution. And in, the result was that in January 1933, Hitler was named chancellor by President Hindenburg. And you can see that uh, President Hindenburg was uh, an old war hero. He had been in the German army for a long, long time and was a well-respected uh, if revered uh, person in German politics and although the Nazis technically had a minority in the Reichstag Hindenburg believed that Hitler was probably the best bet to prevent any kind of uh, communist revolution within Germany and bring about some measure of, of stability Upon taking power in January of 1933, Hitler and the Nazi Party transformed Germany into a one-party dictatorship. And this is really where Hitler took a page out of Mussolini's playbook. Um, he outlawed opposition parties, anybody who was um, considered an enemy was thrown into jail, anybody um, who dared to speak out against Hitler's rule found themselves and their families in great trouble. Germany became a police state, and we saw this happening not only in Italy, but also in the Soviet Union, the idea that the police were given extraordinary powers to keep order. And this often meant jailing people illegally or without due process. Nazi ideals of racial purity became part of official policy. Jews immediately lost their jobs in many industries. They were uh, forbidden from living in certain neighborhoods. They uh, very quickly found themselves in a very precarious position. In schools, teachers were required to measure the sizes of, of students' heads and the color of their eyes and the shape of their faces to determine which students were truly German and truly Aryan and living up to this Nazi fantasy of, of an ideal race in which students were not. The role of women changed very, very quickly from the Weimar years. We see that in the 1920s, German women began to you know, drive cars and smoke cigarettes and you know, wear their dresses you know, up above their knees and uh, things the Nazis really uh, couldn't stand. You know, the Nazis are very much like the Italian fascists, very traditional. They want women to be wives and mothers and to stay at home and take care of their families and leave the public sphere, you know, the, the sphere of politics and work up to the men. It became official policy to reward women for having as many children as possible. And this became uh, uh, part of the great, a great fanfare when it come, came to uh, Nazi family values. Women were given money, they were given medals to have as many children as possible. And this is very interesting because we see that the German population skyrocketed 
between 1900 and 1939, especially in the in the 1930s. And this really gave uh, the Germans a great advantage against, say, the French when World War II came along in 1939. In France, the population was dropping or staying stagnant in those years before World War II. And this is, this is really what uh, gave the army you know, a lot of recruits and what gave the Germans their, their great jump in 1939 and 1940. In Italy, Mussolini created daycare centers where mothers learned how to take care of their children. And this is something that we see um, also in the Soviet Union. So all three nations are building daycare centers not only to get women to take care of their children properly, but also to teach them to be good fascists in the case of Italy, or good Nazis in the case of Germany, or even good communists in the case of the Soviet Union. So the cultivation of the young is something to really pay attention to in this um, in this period. The next uh, propaganda poster we're going to look at has a caption at the bottom that reads, Support the Assistance Program for Mothers and Children. This poster is really an excellent example of Nazi attitudes towards family, especially motherhood. Here we have a German mother who is tenderly breastfeeding her child in the foreground, while in the background the land is being plowed. And we see this uh, beautiful town on the right in the, in the background. You know, the idea that um, the, 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 the Nazis support family especially those who work, you know, they work the land and take care of the nation, they feed the nation and are doing whatever it takes to raise a new generation of of loyal Germans. This is a poster from the film The Eternal Jew. And it's really a grotesque example of Nazi anti-Semitic propaganda. The Eternal Jew was a film that played in Nazi Germany and it portrayed the Jewish people as a scourge as a cancer that needed to be cut out of Germany and Europe and it's a very very disturbing film because it's full of all kinds of falsehoods and inaccuracies and it supports the idea that all the Jews care about is money and the Jews are out to control Germany and the world and we can see from this particular poster, we have a stereotypical Jewish man. You can see the the features are um, overextended, you know, the nose is overextended, and you have a scraggly beard and black cap, much like a, a Russian Jewish peasant would wear, say. And it reminds me of the, the uh, anti-Semitic poster from the Russian Revolution of Leon Trotsky. Um, and here we see that in his right hand, he's holding gold coins, which is a symbol of the Jewish love of money. And then and his, under his left arm, you can see the Soviet Union. And basically, this is a very contradictory kind of message that the poster sends, but it's really saying, look, on the one hand, the Jews love money, but on the other hand, they're responsible for the communist revolution in Russia. And they point to people like Trotsky. You know, Trotsky was a Jew, and look what he did to uh, to to, uh, to Russia. So even though this is a very contradictory view, the the Jew as capitalist and as communist, it does it did play very well in Germany, unfortunately. As you could probably tell by now, the Nazis believe that people respond visually to images and that's really one way to get at people's emotions they really they really understand this in a way that uh, other political movements don't they understand that when people see something they identify with it and now it's taken for granted you know we we see that uh, television has a certain impact on children and adults that the way that uh, companies today market products um, have a lot to do with uh, manipulating the psychology of the viewer 
Well, the the Nazis were really ahead of the game in that regard. Here we have two classic examples of of Nazi propaganda. On the left we have a, a poster. It's Adolf Hitler holding up the Nazi flag high, again a symbol of na uh, of nationalism, and his left fist is clenched in a deterministic pose, and he's marching forward with just thousands of, of men behind him, all dressed the same. They're all dressed in brown shirts carrying flags, a symbol of unity. And the caption reads in German, Germany lives. It's from the 1930s. And what's really striking about this poster is that above him we can see light coming down from the heavens and an eagle uh, flying overhead. It's almost as though the poster is saying that God himself is blessing this movement, this, this nation, with its, its love and its, its light. So this is a very, very effective use of Christian symbolism. And again, you may remember we saw this in, uh, in Russia you know, during the, uh, the Civil War, you know, this manipulation of Christian images. The poster on the right is another classic from the 1930s, but this one is really very much more simple in its its message. Uh, ein Volk, ein Reich, ein Führer, one people, one nation, one leader. And again, it goes back to this idea of of political and social unity. And here we have Hitler. He's looking almost just past. The, uh, the viewer, he's looking, you know, in another direction, and he's almost, he's like, it's like he's looking into the future, and you can see this red glow, uh, behind him. And for us, it's, it's almost demonic looking back on it, but at the time, it probably gave people the idea that here is a leader that's, he, you know, he's, he's, he's anointed by some religious or supernatural force. And this is really another very, very effective, very simple, Propaganda tool, you know, using light to bathe the subject uh, in this kind of glorious um, glow, and it strikes us today as very, very um, kind of evil and, and, and very dangerous. But at the time, it makes Hitler look as though he's a visionary. In Germany and Italy, all unions, groups, and clubs were to be controlled by the state. All were to be fascist in orientation. And what this means is that no private clubs could exist. All groups, clubs, unions, uh, any kind of political organization must be sanctioned by the state. And it must have a fascist mission. Uh, if you're, if you want to join a union in Germany, it's a union that's, um, sanctioned by the Nazis and, uh, the government. In Italy, if you want to join a soccer, uh, league, then the team you play for, every, you know, right before you play, you pledge allegiance to the state. So there can be no private organizations outside of state control and without a fascist mission. At right, we can see a Hitler Youth dagger given to each member. The Hitler Youth was especially popular in uh, the 1930s, and once a, a youngster reached a certain age, around six or seven, um, he or she could join the Hitler Youth. And there were other youth groups that you could join, but the Hitler Youth was the most popular. And it was a type of paramilitary organization, based on the um, the Boy Scouts, and it's where you would learn uh, discipline, you would learn how to be a good Nazi, you would learn the ideals of racial purity, and you would learn to love your leader, and, and all of that, and they would have these big, big retreats in the 1930s, these big campouts, uh, where uh, many children would spend, you know, a weekend in camp, you know, 
uh, living together and, and, and learning what it, what it meant to be patriotic Germans. This is a very interesting example of Nazi attitudes towards the cultivation of the youth. And here we have this uh, freshly scrubbed young German girl who is a member of the League of German Girls, and the goal is to teach German girls how to be eventually wives and mothers, how they will serve the fatherland by bearing children. Uh, they do arts and crafts, and you can see in the background the Nazi flag, which tells us that um, it's sanctioned by, uh, by the state. And this is very important here, that uh, everyone in Nazi Germany is expected to serve the state and put their individual interests aside. That's secondary. Okay, very, very interesting uh, po poster. Now, as I mentioned before, anti-Semitism was the foundation of Nazi rule. And very quickly, the Nazis did what they could to make Jews feel very uncomfortable. In 1935, they passed a major set of legislation called the Nuremberg Laws, which deprived Jews of their citizenship. It also prohibited marriage and sexual intercourse between Jews and non-Jews. Many Jews were forced out of their jobs. Uh, uh, Jews could not go to school with, with non-Jews. Jews had to um, go to special schools just for Jews. It became a very, very difficult time. And it really was the policy of the Nazi party at the time to make the Jews feel so uncomfortable that they would leave. And this is going to be um, something we'll have to discuss a little further down the road, why many could not leave or did not leave. In November 1938, we have Kristallnacht, or Night of the Broken Glass. This is when Nazis orchestrated violence against German Jews. About 100 Jews died in that month. It was open violence against Jews. Uh, Jewish businesses were destroyed. Synagogues were burned. It was very obvious at that point what the Nazis had in store for the, the Jewish people of Germany, that uh, they would do anything they could to make them leave. Between 1939 and 1945, World War II and the Holocaust occurred. And in terms of the Holocaust, the interpretation of it has really been hotly debated over the last 20 or so years. And there's one thing that you really need to remember, and this is that there are two sides to the debate. On one side, we have historians who believe that the Holocaust was the overall intention of the Nazis, and these historians are called intentionalists, that the Nazis intended to kill as many Jews as they could, and that the Holocaust was the primary intention of, of Nazi rule. The other side of the debate are the functionalists, and the functionalists are historians who believe that the Nazis certainly wanted to do harm to, to the Jews, but as far as the Holocaust goes in the gas chambers, they really stumbled into it, that they tried all that they could to scare the Jews away, to make life so horrible for them that they would leave. And we could see this by the Nuremberg Laws and the Kristallnacht, that they were trying to get the Jews to leave uh, willingly, and that when the war started in 1939 and the Germans entered Poland, they all of a sudden had two million Jews under their control, which really multiplied their problem. On top of it, in the 1930s, Jews could not leave Germany because other countries in Europe would not take them. Uh, the United States as well. Um, the French, British, uh, the Soviets, you know, they all had restrictions on Jewish immigration. So this is really the fault line um, between 
historians, you know, in, in, in trying to figure out why the Holocaust happened, the intentionalists and the functionalists. And at right, we see Adolf Hitler with Heinrich Himmler, who was to his right. And Heinrich Himmler was the head of the SS, the elite army regiment that was responsible for uh, many, if not most, of the deaths of Jews in Eastern Europe during World War II. Now, whether the intentionalists are right or whether the functionalists are right is really a matter of debate, and I'll certainly let you think about uh, the different sides. Uh, however, one thing we do know for certain is that uh, Nazism was responsible for the horrors of the Holocaust. Uh, the liquidation of the Jewish population of Europe became the ultimate aim of the Holocaust. Millions of Jews died, approximately uh, 6 million. In addition, Jehovah's Witnesses, Gypsies, Homosexuals were also targeted for, for death. One thing historians do agree upon, and this is something very important to remember about the Holocaust, is that no evidence suggests that the, the the Nazis forced anybody to engage in killing. And the evidence really bears out the fact that if you were a guard in a prison camp, you got that job because you volunteered for it. Nobody was forced to kill anybody else. And uh, one historian, Christopher Browning, in a, a, um, a very famous book, had found evidence that... Um, Germans who could not kill Jews, who, who were sickened by it, were simply reassigned. And, you know, he wasn't killed, and his family wasn't harmed back home. That the Germans really had plenty of people who were willing to uh, view Jews as, as non-human and kill them. It really wasn't a stretch to do that. So that's something you really want to, to think about with the Holocaust. And this is really what makes the Holocaust even more striking and disturbing is that there were many, many soldiers, you know, who were willing to do the killing. Nazi propaganda had helped to dehumanize Jews. The anti-Semitic culture in Europe, not just Germany, had really, um, desensitized a lot of Europeans to the suffering of the Jews. And it's something we really can't deny that um, uh, it was very, very easy to um, to get people to kill, and that's that's one thing you need to really think about. That uh, Hitler himself didn't kill anybody, even though he does bear responsibility for his actions, for inciting this kind of of violence. That uh, the actual killing was carried out by ordinary people, um, just like you and me. And this is really something that. Uh, gives the Holocaust a very chilling dimension.